Wesleyan theology. It'll be quite an adventure. As we go through this discussion, my goal will be focused on the theological elements, but as we do that, it's impossible to separate the history, to understand Wesleyan theology, how it began, how it entered into a trajectory of discussion and practice. We have to embed elements of history throughout. This is a theology that deals with experiences. This is a theology that deals with practices. This is an engaged theology, not simply in a theoretical or ivory tower theology. So while oftentimes in systematic theology, we can attempt to remove the context from the discussion, seemingly able to discuss important theological topics as if they're purely objective and universal. It's never quite possible, but we try it in discussions of systematic theology. Yet in Wesleyan theology, it's even more difficult. It's impossible because Wesleyan theology is by definition engaged and practiced. It derived out of a particular historical context and is expressed in particular historical contexts. And so in this beginning orientation, we're going to follow an approach which I'm going to take throughout these lectures. We're going to have some elements of theology, some elements of history, some elements of application and discussion, all as a way of trying to come to terms with what Wesleyan theology is as a whole and how Wesleyan theology matters for those of us in this day and age, whatever context you find yourself in. A little warning, this will probably be among the longest of the lectures as we begin and focus on John Wesley in this lecture, that's a lot of content. There's a lot of content to put into a 10 week class, especially when theology and history and context and practice are so intertwined. And so in this first lecture, I'm going to talk about John Wesley and he being the most important founder among others who have certainly influenced the movement. It's just a lot of content to, to discuss and a lot of groundwork to set up so that we understand his sources, his trajectory, what he was drawing from to show how Wesleyan theology isn't entirely original, but it's an applied integration of Wesley's own theological influences. And so to get that, to see how Wesleyan theology is making choices among historical debates, we have to do a little bit of the groundwork. And in this first lecture, it's going to take a little longer than the rest of them. But having done that, hopefully we can be a little bit more efficient as we go on. A quote from John Wesley in 1742 from his sermon, Awake Thou That Sleepest. Ye see your calling, brethren. We are to be an habitation of God through his spirit and through his spirit dwelling in us to be saints here and partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So exceedingly great are the promises which are given unto us, actually given unto us who believe. For by faith we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, the sum of all the promises, that we may know the things that are freely given to us of God. The spirit of Christ is that great gift of God, which at sundry times and in divers manners he hath promised to man and hath fully bestowed since the time that Christ was glorified. And it is this, this emphasis on the spirit, this emphasis on the spirit's continuing work, this emphasis that God who has saved us, has called us, has promised, and in that promise has entered into a transforming work, even in our context. That really is how we can understand Wesley's movement. We'll cover the spirit more formally later on, but it's important to see how this very strong pneumatology, which is relatively rare in the Christian West, was such an important guide for Wesley. A brief introduction some basic thoughts on Wesleyan theology. Definition, that's a good place to start, right? Uh, what's, what is Wesleyan theology? Well, it's a theology that is rooted in the ecclesial tradition started by John and Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley tends to get left out of these conversations a lot. Uh, John really was the uh, great organizer, the dynamic uh, leader, and yet Charles Wesley was crucial both in John's own life and in how the Methodist movement developed. Charles Wesley contributed, of course, the hymns, but also a lot of ecclesial discussions. He was a constant presence in the leadership of the movement. And so I say these two together, very close brothers in a lot of ways, and yet very, very different personalities. And it is these two personalities, which I would argue, helped shape what became Methodism early on and laid the groundwork for the trajectory. So theology that is rooted in the ecclesial 
tradition started by John and Charles Wesley. We could call this Methodist theology. That may be the more official movement, but in today's day and age, Methodist is its own denomination, especially the United Methodist Church or other Methodist churches around the world. Yet, because of historical events and transformations and changes and choices, the Wesleyan movement that began in the Methodism has split off into other denominations and groups. And so to, to call this Methodist theology may be formally correct, but it's not as descriptive because Wesleyan theology can exist in a lot of different denominations, not just the Methodist. And when we talk about the Methodist movement in today's day and age, of course, we tend to think of the Methodist church, which is fine. It's just, I don't want to exclude the many different groups that have been influenced by the Wesleys. It's not necessarily new theology, however. I've mentioned that. It incorporates themes from many traditions. It orients these in a particularly evangelical direction. And so it's really considered one of the key branches of, of Protestant theology as it draws from historical discussions that, that predates the Protestant movement, but also expresses these within key Protestant Reformation themes. John Wesley really wouldn't be considered one of the reformers. He comes much later onto the scene than that. But he, the movement itself draws from Reformation debates and orients these in a distinct tradition that has allowed it to contribute to the evangelical movement, especially in England, in Britain, around the world, and in America, and become a distinct partner with its, the Reformed churches, which derive from John Calvin's work, as, as another major partner in that. Oftentimes, these two movements are caught in debates or controversies. They tend to want to exclude the other, and yet in these two movements, we can see important themes, different emphases, a lot of shared values, a lot of shared goals, but different emphases that then the other doesn't always quite understand. And so one of the goals of this course is not to dismiss or reject reform theology or to say that Wesleyan theology is the only appropriate, but to show how in discussing Wesleyan theology in its fullest sense, we can see how bigger picture of Christian theology can be understood in cooperation with Reformed theology. Yes, there are some disagreements, and we'll cover those throughout the quarter. But these aren't not, I would argue, as decisive as some have made them out to be, as some of the more strident participants in each movement want them to be. The Wesleyan theology began with the Wesleyan Methodist Church, just simply the Methodist Church, which the Methodism wasn't a name they chose, but they adopted early on as methods became part of ecclesial practice and community life. This Methodist church that John Wesley started is split into different denominations and connections, as they called them, including the African Methodist Episcopal, the AME Church, one of the earliest branches of the Methodist movement. And then later on, churches that identify with the holiness tradition, among others. We'll get into how these developed, and then along the course of this quarter, we'll talk about the AME church, church in a few weeks. We'll talk about the holiness movement, churches, and some others along the way. The Methodist church, of course, would be the one that has the most direct lineal connection. Though there are arguments to be made that they don't always have the same ethical or theological positions as Wesley. For instance, as, as we'll discover, Wesley was very, very strongly against slavery and racism. Decisively, he was he, he saw it as a great evil, and yet later on in the 19th century, the uh, early holiness movement churches like the Wesleyans and, and others split off from the Methodist church because the Methodists uh, wanted to hold on to slavery. So simply because uh, these churches split off does not mean they were separated from Wesley's own doctrine. And indeed, that's, that's part of the challenge of this quarter is to see what is truly Wesleyan in theology versus what has become denominational or traditional or is this part of the context. And so as we navigate this discussion, we're going to see what is really Wesleyan theology have to say and in that allow us to critique our own churches or our own theology or at least understand how a Wesleyan theology can offer corrections or in itself need corrections. Some basic themes in a Wesleyan theology. There's an emphasis on a script scriptural holiness. Scripture is the primary guide, and scriptural holiness is, is a way of saying wanting to be true to God's calling. As indicated in scripture, this is not legalism, though it can drift into legalism, of course, but a scriptural holiness is one that is oriented in love, not legalism. It's a fine line and one that has often not been well navigated. A practical discipleship. What does it mean to be holy? Well, it's, it's not about doing these very esoteric actions. It's 
about living life as Christ would have us live in the context we're in, helping those around us, helping the poor, visiting those in prison, you know, things that Wesley himself did. It's a disciplined fellowship. And so it's a collection of people who are pursuing the depths of the Christian life together, using formal means in order to deepen their own growth and to help others deepen. So there's a communal nature, but also an orderly nature. It's not a haphazard, you become saved and that's the end of the process. You become saved and that's the entry into a life of discipline so that we are oriented as the Spirit calls us. This doesn't just work out into individual transformation. This is expressed outwardly as well, inviting other people in, drawing other people in, sharing the good news, really good news that God offers a loving transformation in our lives. And so this extends to those in our neighborhoods and those around the world. Christian perfection. Now this is the one that is, is often most commonly associated with distinctly Wesleyan theology and also most commonly misunderstood. Not least because Wesleyan Wesley himself was a little vague on the topic, and the term itself is probably not the best. The word sanctification is what this implies, and sanctification implies a holiness that is drawn by the Spirit so that we become kind of people who don't sin. Now, does that, that sound impossible? Well, that's the question as we navigate this. Is it possible to live a life without sin. Now, we'll never say that you have never sinned. The scripture warns against ever saying that. Everyone has sinned. Every, Wesley would, would affirm original sin. But he would argue that the presence of the Holy Spirit draws us forward into a place where we are no longer consciously choosing to sin. Revivalist spirituality. If you go from a place of sinning a lot to resisting the call of sin, that leads to a big change. And oftentimes that big change can exist in a sudden kind of experience where there is a great emotional and physical transformation as you as a person is awakened to the life of God in their lives and awakened to how that can lead them in new patterns of worship and new patterns of interaction. This revivalism has an emotional component, but we don't want to limit it emotional because it has it's worked out in often very practical ways. But this sudden nature, this exciting nature, this moment of transformation becomes a marker of what the Methodist movement did early on. And again, it's not just an individualistic approach. It's not just a piety that is oriented towards one's own personal private relationship with God. There's no sense of that in Wesleyan theology, that religion is just a private experience uh, or personal experience. In being transformed, we become the kind of people who live out this life in our society, becoming people who are responsible for others, responsible to Christ in the power of the Spirit, and in that living lives that help those around us. Not so that somehow we can be a, our, our sin can be forgiven or we have guilt because we love them. We have a responsibility to their family because we love them, to our neighbors because we love them, because we are called to live as Christ lived. This insists on a social responsibility on whatever issues may be happening in our social, immediate social context and intellectual development. John Wesley was extremely intelligent, extremely learned, and while not all of his ministers who became early Methodist pastors were likewise well-educated, in fact, some were very poorly formally educated, all throughout Wesley's life and throughout the Methodist movement, there's been an emphasis on intellectual development, however this can be achieved. An emphasis on reading. Wesley recommended reading four to six hours a day. Maybe that will f help you feel better as you Look at the reading list for this class. It's relatively light compared. So while some movements like the, the later fundamentalist movement or some have have rejected intellectualism, and, and re especially after the, the classical liberal movements of the 19th century, and, and saw formal theological training as a barrier, the, the Methodist Wesleyan approach has always been to embrace learning, to, to embrace it critically, not accept it just because it sounds learned, but to engage the readings, engage the writings, engage in intellectual development in conversation, and one's own understanding of scripture, one's own understanding of hi church history. Wesley had a a vast amount of recommended readings for his people and encourage a constant lifelong pursuit of intellectual development that is pursued precisely because it is the spirit who awakens our reason and informs us as part of this journey. Now, you'll see these small little notes that I'll occasionally read out loud at the bottom, these little bits of trivia, and I'll read this one. Now, John Wesley did not intend to start a new denomination, and both his theology and his intent was rooted in the Church of England. He was a reformer within his movement, and, 
And so that Church of England of its time had a wide range of spiritual and intellectual traditions, of which John Wesley was really a continuing part. Many of those in leadership of the Church of England, however, had problems with his reforming goals. And add to this the problem of the split in North America when the American colonies broke off from England. We had a major division that, that necessitated some kind of new start, and that exacerbated what became a split. John Wesley never saw his movement as a separation movement. He saw it as a reforming movement, which is important as we consider how this fits into both the history of the last 300 years and our own context. <laughs>